All right, so for lecture seven, week nine, we're gonna talk about Erlen noise. We're also gonna talk about fractal Brownian motion um, as well, but Erlen noise is uh, kind of the, the topic, or really I think this, this uh, particular lecture is just gonna be about noise in general. And when we say noise in game development, we don't really mean noise, right? The traditional, like the, the actual definition of noise is a random process with some kind of perhaps frequency assumptions. So for example, you've got pink noise and brown noise and things like that, which just means like white noise, white noise being a uniform distribution of frequencies uh, that are random. Uh, running it through a low pass filter gives you brown noise, meaning you listen to brown noise, it kind of sounds like a rumble, right? Whereas uh, when you listen to uh, high pitched noise, like, like pink noise, that's taking that white noise and running it through a high pass filter. So Perlin noise uh, actually was a algorithm developed by uh, Perlin, I guess his name was, I don't really remember. I'm not sure what the name, who did it and if it's the guy's name or if it's uh, a, uh, just for whatever reason, but it was actually developed for the movie Tron, the original movie Tron, this is the second one that came out later, right? But the original movie Tron needed a believable, uh, kind of organic looking noise that was going to be believable by the audience. And so this technique, uh, and we'll talk about what Perlin noise entails and what that means and all that, uh, this technique was actually in, in, imagined and developed for the Tron movie, so it's pretty cool. Uh, actually, in the reading, so there were a couple of original readings in this course. I've, pr I've provided the original ones, but I've also included this one, the Book of Shaders 11, uh, which I really love this particular approach to Perlin noise. This, this, the Book of is just a really terrific resource. Beautiful shaders, beautiful images, really great tutorials and walkthroughs about a lot of really valuable things uh, that you can be using in your game development uh, journey. Um, but you know, the, uh, but, but this does kind of go into that as does Perlin's original noise. I guess it is his name um, either way. So cool, we're gonna be talking about Perlin noise. We're also gonna be talking about Brownian motion, uh, fractal Brownian motion specifically. And you can see on the right here, this image of these uh, you know, procedurally generated landscapes. This is a, a, a output of fractal Brownian motion as we'll talk about. And uh, so why are we interested in this? Um, what's the point of noise in the context of games? And then how does this interact with, with AI? Like, what are we talking about here? Well, let's talk a little bit about natural terrain. Uh, natural terrain uh, is sort of randomized. There's a lot of random stuff going on, perceivably, but it's not super random. It's not actually random. And why is this important for our games? Well, we are creating these environments that, that users are playing in. And those users have to interact with the environment. The environment has to be believable. So if you actually give people a truly randomized environment, which is essentially going to be true noise and true noise as we've talked about, there's no rhyme or reason uh, to two points in a random noise. So this might be at, at t uh, height 10 meters and the, the point next to it might be negative 10. And that doesn't happen in reality, right? If you look at natural terrain, there's a kind of relationship between points in the terrain, right? If it's not a perfect uh, continuous surface, right? If you have terrain, you can have discontinuities like these canyons, right? But these discontinuities come in these sort of perceivable patterns, right? These shapes, these outlines. Um, whereas outside of those discontinuities, you see even um, these steep areas, the points next to each other have some kind of relationship, right? And if you really stare deeply at this canyon image, you can kind of start to say, well, this canyon was formed due to a process such as water dripping and erosion and, and such and such. And you can eventually kind of walk back why this particular uh, you know, organization of matter has resulted over, say, millions of years. And I think this is generally true about most terrain. Human beings are very good at picking up features in terrain such as mountains, valleys, lakes, and so on. And so while things are random-ish, they're not really random. They're sort of uh, 
kind of comfortably random or random in a way that, you know, there are certain things that are randomized, but th those things are processes that then apply to other more kind of heuristic or more expected type of things that then result in what looks like the final terrain. So now you can kind of hear what Perlin was trying to do with Perlin noise for the movie Tron, right? Because if you present the, um, the viewer of the movie with truly random noise, it kind of sucks, right? You kind of, it's, it's just noise. It just looks like snow on a TV set that, well, maybe you all aren't too familiar with what TVs used to do with the snow on the TV and the randomness of the signal, but it just, it doesn't look very appealing. Um, so you need some kind of randomness that uh, sort of makes sense between two points in a way that could be described and so on. So uh, let's talk a little bit about more mechanically uh, how terrain works in games. And often you would kind of do this with a height map, right? So height maps are an image. It can be black to white. It doesn't matter what it's codified, but you basically have a minimum value and a maximum value. How you visualize this is irrelevant. You can colors you can do with black and white um, and then what this is doing is it's mapping uh, kind of on a plane a lowest and highest point you can kind of imagine taking a, a square such as this one and then mapping it to a, a plane or a quad and then the height the the value in that height map at a particular uv coordinate represents the you know physical height of that thing so you can do this with displacement of a mesh. You can do this with techniques like parallax occlusion, if you've used those. Um, there's a lot of approaches here in how you could leverage this in, in a game to produce what looks like terrain from a height map. But then how do you produce, uh, okay, here's an example in, uh, in a game. But how do you produce uh, these height maps? Like what do you put them in them so you could draw them and, and such, but then you might not be a great artist and, and you want to make um, believable landscapes. Uh, and, and so how do you kind of approach that? And that's where the noise comes in. You can take and generate a height map from some kind of noisy thing that gives you believable terrain, especially if you're building a game that's procedurally generated where you're not actually even designing these things and there has to be some kind of continuity. So for example, Minecraft uh, uses this a lot. In fact, it's, that's the entire game. Um, we're going to use some terms that come from uh, digital signal processing or just signals in general. Um, if you've done any kind of waves or uh, frequency based stuff or anything around signals or even just basic trigonometry, you're, you might already be familiar with some of these terms. But uh, one term is amplitude. So the amplitude is essentially if you have a wave, what's the maximum and the minimum? What's that difference between the max and min point? If you have a wave, for example, imagine a uh, we have a rope and you're you're uh, vibrating it and it's creating kind of these waves right as they propagate through the string if you vibrate it faster you're creating higher amplitude waves uh, or if you're at the beach a big wave has a bigger amplitude than a small wave even if they're coming at you at the same speed which they tend to do so um amplitude is literally the height of these uh frequency is the frequent like okay so if you have a string and you vibrate it at some frequency Right, you can count how many times a second you're vibrating it. Um, so when you increase that vibration, that's higher frequency. When you reduce it, that's lower frequency. Generally speaking, frequency is the inverse of a period. So the frequency is how many times per second, and a period is, how, is, is a, the length of time that it takes for a full revolution. If you think about this on the unit circle, right, you start on the, on the circle and you're going around and around the circle. Imagine being on a carousel. Um, the faster you go around the carousel, the less time it takes to do a revolution. And that's kind of the relationship between frequency and uh, period. So, yeah. Uh, and I guess one kind of comment here, because, uh, you know, you can identify a wave um, as a sort of frequency when it's pretty low frequency. But once it gets very high frequency, even small fluctuations start to look a lot like noise. Why this is interesting to us. So some interesting information about this is more specific to DSP or sorry not D but like any kind of signal processing but often we think about this in terms of sound because waves sound is, are generally propagated by way of the wave of uh, the 
vibrations and resonances of, of, uh, of, of, of air in our vicinity. And so you can actually combine waves. You can do what's called superposition of waves. And the result of that is what's called a modulated wave, as you can kind of see in the top here. This is essentially taking a wave and adding to it um, you know, higher frequency components. And if you do this for enough times, you eventually get a square wave, right? Uh, and then this ringing is sort of this, um, I believe it's called the Gibbs phenomenon. I always forget. Yes, so it is the Gibbs phenomenon. I just have to confirm. But the Gibbs phenomenon happens as you try to approximate these um, discontinuous, discontin discontinuities in signals using periodic functions. If you've ever studied like Fourier transforms and Fourier series, it's exactly this. Eventually you get these sort of more and more accurate, more and more discontinu dis discontinuous uh, functions, but with these ringing effects at the fringes. So you can kind of see that happening in this Batman looking thing over here. But the long story short of this is that you can combine various frequencies together and the result is also a wave. Uh, and you can kind of do this, for example, with a, you can see a sine wave has one frequency value. So a, a sine wave is pure, is a pure frequency, right? Triangle has a lot of discontinuities and, by, and to, uh, to try to approximate it using a bunch of pure frequencies or a Fourier transform, start to get a lot of these strange um, overtones, as it's called for music. Uh, same thing with a sawtooth or a pulse. And you can kind of, um, uh, this gets really deep into DSP. I don't think it's really valuable to go too deep in here. It's just, I have a lot of background in this, so I can talk about it for a long time. But uh, j just know that the sound of, of the, the sound of these waves or the sort of spectral aspect of these waves is dictated by how close it is to a fundamental sine wave, right? That's the farther away you get from a fundamental sine wave, the more frequencies are required to represent that. And the place that this is sort of, uh, you know, that this sort of breaks down into a kind of singularity is a delta impulse. Like, a, like imagine this pulse here as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller to represent that with a set of, let's call it uh, discrete, um, you know, a, a discrete set of um, frequencies, you're eventually going to have to use every frequency ever to represent a pure uh, impulse. This is interesting. This gets into also how a lot of physics. It's really fun, it's fun stuff. So I recommend if you're interested in this, please mention it in the Discord. I'm happy to go deeper into it. It's an interesting subject. So could we uh, use this principle, like you're already seeing this kind of randomness appear what looks like organic type of shapes when we're combining these sine waves. Um, could we do this with terrain? But if we do, it's um, kind of irregular. It's gonna be very regular, right? We're sort of limited to these things as, as we try to create more discontinuous, discontinuous type of things. We're gonna get this Gibbs phenomenon and the ringing. So it might be kind of boring, right? We might have this image that rolling hills are fine, but as soon as you try to do something like Mount Everest, good luck with that, right? Having a peaky peak is going to be very difficult. So what if we're not limited to uh, just, you know, pure frequencies? Uh, so it's a really cool technique in DSP called, uh, well, in signal pro processing called wavelets. And instead, in a way, so previously we were combining a bunch of sine waves. What if we're not limited to just these waves? What if we used a, what's called a wavelet? And a wavelet is kind of this mathematical function that is wave-like that has certain spectral properties uh, that we can just sort of add together in a variety of different sort of scalings and uh, frequency multiplications, meaning just like a sine wave and I go with different frequencies, I could sort of shorten this and make it a higher frequency wavelet. Um, and these become a little bit more complicated and we can get much more interesting and complex uh, things. And, and as a result, you know, we do get slightly more randomized and slightly more interesting waveforms more easily. In fact, wavelets were introduced to avoid specifically that ringing phenomenon that uh, we, we got with the Gibbs, the, the Gibbs phenomenon. Uh, but the issue is that it's uh, too kind of predictable, right? We're still in this sort of periodic schema where things tend to, you know, have symmetries and things like that where the real world doesn't really exhibit those kinds of symmetries, at least in the physical manifestations of terrain. So, well, we tried, but it, we didn't quite get there. Um, so what about 
noise. And so white noise, right, is essentially just a bunch of uncorrelated, uh, you know, frequencies. So you, there's, there's every, no, like there are independent uh, string of samples, right, between zero and one. And when I say independence, just like a coin toss, the value before you has nothing to do with the next value and the value after. They're really independent. And so, you know, we could do this also with uh, Gaussian white noise. So here we kind of, um, you know, apply a probability distribution to the sample. So each sample is uh, random, but we can kind of map it against a, a normal distribution so that the value that we get is sort of has a certain kind of expectations with a particular variance, right? So you can do this with uniform or you can do this with Gaussian. It doesn't really matter. What the Gaussian does is it allows the value to kind of stick closer to the average. Often the average is like zero or, or something like that, right? So, you know, what we want is we kind of want this wavelet idea with a sort of pseudo-random fashion, um, and we want to add different frequencies to get different levels of scale. And this actually works quite well Right, the idea, basically, kind of this slide and what we're saying here is we're going to use all the techniques and combine them, <laughs> and then layer them as well to get sort of a variety of resolutions of the tail. And this kind of makes sense because if you look at terrain, right, you can kind of see that there are varying degrees of randomness. Right, you've got the sort of average level of the. The, the, the world, right? So this isn't necessarily the, the peaky peaks, but they're more kind of like the planes and the sort of average level. And from there, you have progressively more sharp features like, okay, now you've got hills and on the hills, sometimes you have rocks jutting out and on the rocks, you have little bumps and you can get deeper and deeper and deeper and eventually get to a very, very fractal in nature. And when you say fractal, what we're meaning, what often we're doing, we're going, we're splitting something up and continuously having a, a different function that we're looking up as we go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and one way to do this is by, is by doing this, by saying, well, we're going to have a progressive layering of these functions. And so you can kind of see this here, right, where we add all of these functions together and we get this very interesting kind of uh, thing. Now, this is kind of jumping ahead a little bit. It's like, oh, here's Perlin noise. And, um, and I will say one thing about Perlin noise, like this, these, these value, these um, functions here are Perlin noise. What Perlin noise does is it sort of, it, it samples points, right? In some kind of resolution, often it'll split up a area into like 256 samples. And each one of those is random, with some kind of uh, frequency involved, right? So by, when we say frequency, it's how, how much are we splitting up that that line segment? So it's almost like we're taking. Let me draw. I don't know. I'm allowed to do. So here we're like sampling. We have a line, right? This is our number line. This is zero, right? And we're going to sample here, 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 and here, so on. And when we do the these are the these are the random samples that we drew when we did so. You can kind of see, right? And then. Say I want this sample here, uh, what I do is I, in, well, okay. I interpolate, I interpolate the values in between them. So this is what Perlin noise is doing, is it's sort of saying, okay, we're gonna take this area and we're going to split it up into kind of these segments. And then the segments, um, you know, we're gonna interpolate, well, for values between, we're gonna interpolate through them like, you know, bicubic or something like that. When you want higher frequency, you just do this in a much more dense, fashion. It's almost like saying this, this is uh, frequency four and this is frequency 16, right? So if you were to like zoom in here, you would look, it would look very similar in terms of the resolution and even more so here, right here, this area maps to that something. So now what we do is we just combine everything, right? And we add it all together. And the result is this very, what looks very kind of terrain like uh, type of um, outcome. Trace everything. But yeah, th this is sort of the idea. Um, sorry for the kind of crash course into Perlin noise. It's, it's not too relevant how this is done. I mean, there's, we'll, we'll talk about it, but um, check out the, the articles and the resources in this week's lecture to really get a fundamental feel of how to implement this. Because
It's just a lookup table uh, and then interpolating between the values. You can do this for 2D or 3D, it doesn't really matter, um, right? For 2D, you just take a line segment and you map things out. For 2D, you have an array, right? And then you kind of have to interpolate in 2D, right? Because a value between pixels um, needs to be kind of figured out. But you can see the results are quite um, effective, right? We can create these terrains that look quite good. And if you ever used Unity's terrain system, uh, you've, you've been using this system. So this is what's going on. You can see kind of this trick that's often used. What often is done is you have a water level and below that water level, it's water, right? So you can kind of create this really noisy environment and you have a level that's considered water and you can kind of map the texture from zero, which kind of looks like coastline to, you know, peaky peaks of, of uh, snow and so on in a rock and kind of create this gradient, a texture that goes from something to another thing. This is all procedural results. So uh, basic Perlin noise, uh, you basically take a set of random variables that are wavelet, wavelet gradient of unit length and n dimensions. Um, long story short there is you have a table <laughs> and that maps to a particular resolution. Um, and then you evaluate a wavelet with a randomized gradient at each point, um, which is just essentially drawing samples that with a random number generator, you can do it with a wavelet combination, whatever you want. Um, and then you calculate the dot products of the distance and the gradient vectors and you interpolate between. Them. That's the idea. Um, there's nothing too fancy going on here, right? You're essentially saving into a array, either 2D or 3D or 1D, um, a bunch of random values. And when you need the value between those values, interpolate between. Um, so that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, you can also do this in multiple frequencies and add it together. So you don't need to add the whole thing in. You can kind of create, uh, right, like because all of the Perlin noise is going to be of the same amplitude of zero to one. And so as you go into higher frequency, you can say, well, we want it to be noisy, but we want it to apply to the signal less. And so kind of a good example of this is you start off with something like, uh, like a, you know, kind of a mountainy kind of thing. Right, and then you want something more buzzy. Instead, this is zero and one, right? So if I were to apply something that looks like this, the full zero one here, I'm gonna get something like this. It's gonna look like nonsense. Um, but what I wanna do, let me start over. Right? I wanna start off with kind of something undulating, and then I'm going to create something that's more noisy. I'm not going to add it all the way. I'm going to add it at a quarter amplitude, right? So now I get something kind of like that that sits on top of it a little bit. Now I have I want another one that's even more noisy, right? And that sits on top of that. So the result is something that kind of looks more natural, right? With still these high frequency components, but they're not like blowing up your signal. Oops. That's the idea. Um, so fractal Brownian motion is really useful for terrain generation with Perlin noise. So again, Perlin noise is just a sort of way to interpolate between values such that you can kind of have noise that's appealing and not too random, right? Kind of create this uh, at a particular set of frequencies, you know, a lookup that you then interpolate between. So the values that you're interpolating between are random, but the values between the interpolation are obviously interpolated and, and so are related to one another in that way. Um, so the idea with fractal Brownian motion is we're going to just combine a lot of you know, frequencies of uh, sine waves, and this kind of creates a little bit more random. Random, like you, you can do Perlin noise with a, with like a random number generator, like a uniform distribution or a, or a Gaussian, but Fractal Brownian motion brings to Perlin noise a little bit more believability because you can see uh, here on the top, this is a um, kind of a just a, a, what you would get from Perlin noise. At the bottom, you get much more interesting results. These are much more natural type of results. 
uh, because you can see in true randomization, you've got kind of like these clusters that, that appear. And while the, it doesn't quite, it, it's pretty appealing for certain use cases, right? The bottom probably is more representative of what you would see if you were to look at like, a, to, like the topology of a physical terrain. Um, or it looks more like a cloud or it, more, it looks more like, uh, you know, these kind of random processes, right? Whereas if you were to just do a random random, like a truly random uh, noise, this, things wouldn't look this way. It would just look like a speckled mess and there would be no real order to it. And if anything, it'll look more like the top because there will be certain clusters and things. And it almost looks like, and, and this is sort of what is happening when you do just traditional uniform noise or Gaussian noise with Perlin, it's, it's almost like you've taken a very noisy signal with no order and, and kind of blurred it because that's exactly what we're doing. We're creating this noise and then we're mapping through it. So when you have something that's a little bit more uh, like like FBM, like fractal Brownian motion, you've got something that's a little bit more cohesive. Values that we're interpolating between are slightly more interesting. And on top of that, you can add and layer these things and you can get very sort of speckly, uh, detailed type of maps. So uh, octaves, this has to do with how many layers we're putting together, like we're sandwiching on top of each other. Uh, frequency is how many points into the space, how many times are we sampling in, like to, to what density are we doing this? And right, you can kind of, already we've talked about how different octaves should be at different frequencies, although you can play with combining octaves, the same octaves, uh, oh sorry, octaves of the same frequency. There's really no rules of what's the best way to do this. Um, the amplitude is how tall things are. So for, again, when you have low frequency components, often those have bigger amplitude than the high frequency components because we don't want the, the, the high frequency components to be too outsized. But again, there's no rules here. Maybe that's what, that is what you want, so it's up to you. Um, lacunarity, which uh, I'm not too familiar with this term, but basically, oh, I see. It, it, it's how each octave multiplied, right? So it's almost like the decay when you have, you know, again, like what I was just saying, high frequency components that are generally have lower amplitude than the lower frequency components. And this lacunarity, I guess, is the, the way that that relationship happens. Um, and gain, um, which gain is, is, I'm not so sure that the applicability of gain is, is really makes sense. In, in signal processing, generally speaking, when you talk about gain, you're saying how one, uh, like how an amplifier or how some kind of circuit or process amplifies uh, another signal and gain can happen both in amplitude and frequency. Right? For example, a low pass filter will have a gain of one for the low, the frequency it's, it's passing, but you know, an increasingly reduced gain for higher frequency, right? So um, gain can make sense in this because you may be kind of filtering things out and you can do that by way of uh, octaves and systems and that. Uh, so, you know, uh, you can turn up the gain, just maybe this, this is the term, term's intention here, is that the gain is sort of like your overall multiplication factor, uh, right? Like what is the height of things? Kind of what's the maximum height? So you, this allows you to kind of, you know, increase things or reduce things. I think in machine learning and AI, generally this term is more commonly referred to as temperature. Uh, but gain is fine um, for persistence. So here's kind of some examples that we'll go through. Right here's a, an example of Perlin noise with one hertz and octave one lacunarity one. You can see here now we've added two hertz, so it's twice as fast. There's only one octave in play here. Here we have eight hertz, uh, and you can see how much more noisy it is. Right, there's a lot more bumps and pumps and things. So here we go back to one, but the lacunarity is 1.2 and the octaves are 16, right? Which means we have 16 layers and at each layer we have a reduction of 1.2 in amplitude. Uh, and the combination kind of results in this much more kind of natural, uh, organic look. And same here, you can see the lacunarity here is 1.3 and so get a little bit more noisy faster because the decay is real. Um, uh, 
upper limb noise is commonly done wrong. So very often uh, you just use a straight random array and not a list of 256 random va values. Um, don't want to do just a random random array. That's actually just noise. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, you've got much fewer flat areas and a lot less kind of well-defined hills as a result. So again, this kind of goes back to also how you draw those random variables. And if you use like a uniform thing or a Gaussian, right, uniform is going to get you the most kind of not uniform results, which is funny how to say it out loud that way. But you do a uniform thing, these values are unrelated to one another, and it's going to be very kind of nonsensical, at least with a Gaussian, you can kind of expect a particular, these things to be close to a particular value, you can use the gain or temperature to kind of, you know, amplify the, the irregularities. But if you use something like fractal Brownian motion, you even have the ability to kind of play around with this, run the things a little bit, and get something that looks a lot more organic, but still behaves like this interpolative uh, Perlin noise. Um, so, like as I mentioned before, uh, especially with any kind of generative, uh, procedurally generated materials and so on, there's no like right way to do any of this stuff, right? For example, one of my favorite things to do about Perlin noise is what you do is you um, so, so noise goes up and down, or you usually go at zero, but what you can do is you can invert. So any value below zero, like negative, uh, just gets pushed to positive. So you do the absolute value. This is pretty fun because if kind of give you an example, right? Say you have something like this, well, that's really bad, but okay. Something like this, right? And this is say zero here. And so if I flip the script, this point is going to go up, and this point is going to go up. What you end up having is something that kind of looks like this, but then you have this discontinuity here. And what's cool is if you look at this from a 2D standpoint, often what you get is you get these sort of um, boundaries. I'll see in a second in the next slide uh, that, that start to look like kind of Vornoy type of regions. Uh, which is pretty fun. So you can get pretty you know, creative here in what you do. You can do things like take it to the power of two and apply rectification like I just did and a bunch of other things that are nonlinear in nature. But there is no such thing as correct. And these are all hyperparameters that you can mess around with and play with and, and see what you get. Um, I recommend that you guys try that. So here's an example of, you know, you can do this for city generation, you can do this for fire, for materials, for... Um, obviously, rain, um, or if you're making a game that involves some kind of gathering, crafting, and what have you, like Minecraft, for example, right? You use this to create the distribution through which uh, materials are, are discovered in your world. Very valuable. In fact, and this is a blog post from a long time ago from uh, Notch, who's a Minecraft developer, right? They started off with Pearl and Noise. Um, and then added a bunch of layers, uh, but then eventually worked off of a 3D pearl and noise instead of ground height. And so you can kind of dig into this, see how you start off with one system and then you add different things, you see what works, and then you kind of iterate from there until you get to something that you like. So yeah, um, here, in case you want to pause and read this little Cool. So there are other noises. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them. There's a lot, uh, but let's talk about some of them. So this is the midpoint displacement algorithm. It's a fractal algorithm. And basically you have points, you divide the points into the midpoints, and then you uh, basically uh, subdivide until you're done. You add some randomization so you can do some mean of the values and some randomization and this sort of controls how rough it is and you just iterate and iterate and iterate until you get to the resolution you want. I'm not sure what this is, black areas. Maybe there's an image, I don't know, it didn't come through. But the idea being you just take an area, you subdivide it until you get to the resolution of your intention. Um, and it's this sort of combination of mean and stochasticity that ultimately arrives you at your final text. The diamond square algorithm, which I'm not too familiar with, um, but basically this sort of fixes square artifacts by using diamonds. Square is at 45 degrees, so you know you you 
here I'll walk through the steps. You initialize four corner values. It's very similar to the, min to the midpoint one. You calculate a midpoint. You calculate those midpoints. You calculate those midpoints. Um, and then you calculate the midpoints of the diamonds. Calculate the midpoints of the diamonds and so on. So you kind of go in this kind of crosshatch approach. Uh, again, I'm not super familiar with this algorithm. I've not used it myself. But you can kind of see how this approach allows you to create some kind of relationship between values and triangle. Well, in this not triangulate, but quadrilate. I don't know. Um, but but you can kind of create these relationships, respective points, and the result is a noise that isn't too random and has some kind of relationship, but also is random enough. So there are other options. Uh, Vernoy diagrams. So Vernoy um, regions are take a take a region and you just drop a bunch of you know points in there, and then Vernoy regions or the, the I'm not too familiar with the algorithm to calculate these regions, so I apologize. I always meant to really dig in here. But Voronoi regions are the regions that you can draw that sort of maximize uh, the, the space of each one of the regions, given that these points that you dropped into this area um, you know, are, do occupy those things. So you can kind of, it's really fun actually. There's like an example online of people in an elevator always tend to uh, sort of position themselves in such a way as to maximize this Bournoy <laughs> diagram, right? So if you ever walked into a busy elevator and there's a lot of people there and you kind of shift around to sort of maximize your distance from everybody around you to kind of, you know, optimize your personal space, you actually are doing this thing, um, this sort of natural thing. This is uh, also, I'm sure this looks a lot like bubbles when you have a bunch of bubbles in like on, you know, on the top of a, um, a beverage or maybe you're in the bath and you're playing with a bubble bath. And you see these bubbles and they're all kind of crowding a sort of limited space. Uh, they tend to kind of behave in this sort of funky way. Um, so th you can kind of see the shapes of these Vernoy regions are quite organic looking. Um, but, you know, the downside is that it takes a lot of computation. So fair, like do it, save it, and now that's your... Um, kind of thing in your regions and the way that you want it to, to look and you're never going to you're not going to calculate it real time but if you're trying to do this in real time it's a pre it's, it can be a computationally intensive type of thing uh Vernoy is particularly useful for the mountains so kind of think back to that example i gave about um you know uh people in a in a room uh, in, a, in a in an elevator actually what's really cool here let me pull this up really quickly so what's really fun is you can actually see a lot of these um, patterns show up in, 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 in um, nature. For example, in the canopy of trees, uh, you can see how trees don't touch each other. They might look like it from the ground, but when you look up, you tend to see the very cool, uh, very beautiful, um, sort of Vornoy looking um, separations. So yeah, it's useful for a lot of things. Um, Often, you know, as I've mentioned, you can use all of these things together. So you use Vornoy to define regions, you add Perlin noise to give the detail, and then you make the use fractal Brownian motion, make the details more interesting, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, one, one thing I kind of want to bring up here is that th this is just sort of scratching the surface and many randomization noise algorithms and so on are, are kind of works of art more so than they are a uh, very specific uh, scientific techni technical thing. So, you know, this is a good place to start and to be inspired, but don't, don't hold back. There's a lot of ways to approach this stuff. And the best way to do it is through experimentation and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all. That's all really for noise as used for procedural generation, game development, and so on in a way, because what we want is we don't want real noise. We want kind of, believable noise, which means it's noisy-ish. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thanks for watching.